Are fish ever cannibals? What is fish stocking? And how does one become a Dr. Fish? Let's get to it and ask Dr. Fish. Okay, welcome to Ask Dr. Fish, everybody. As you can see, um, we do not have Stuart Carlton today, so you have Carolyn making horn music instead. Um, but first, let's introduce our hosts. Uh, first, Dr. Katie O'Reilly, who is a Dr. Fish and is the Aquatic Invasive Species Specialist for Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Katie, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Even better being serenaded by a lovely, a lovely horn, horn solo. So thank you, Carolyn. <laughs> You're very, very welcome. Our second Ask Dr. Fish is Dr. Titus Eilhammer, who is a fishery specialist with Wisconsin Sea Grant. Titus, how are you today? Good morning. It is a wonderful, this is, you know, my favorite day of the every other month. So uh, great to be here talking to you too. Um, Hey, you know, Stuart, he's great, but we're going to have fun without him too. <laughs> and uh, of course, I am not a Dr. Fish. I am not a doctor anything. I am the research coordinator with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. My name is Carolyn Foley, and I will be popping in and out, also trying to help run things behind the scenes today. Um, so as a reminder, if you have not joined us before, this is Ask Dr. Fish, where um, we can take your uh Fish questions, science questions, or life questions live. The easiest way to ask questions of the doctors during the show today in particular is going to be to type them into the chat if you're watching us on Facebook or YouTube. But otherwise, we're going to start having a conversation about some topics anyway, because there are cool things that come up. So, um, <laughs> Katie, I believe you said uh, no, nothing better to talk about on a Monday morning. Let's talk about cannibalism in fish. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, there is no better way to kick off, you know, a busy work week than talking about cannibalism. Uh, so this was inspired. There was a, a news article that came out about some uh, fossils that had been, uh, I think, re-examined. And what they found is this ancient fish species had some younger, uh, you know, younger members of the same species in its uh, digestive system. And you know, this is kind of cool because it shows that, you know, this this ancient you know species was was doing cannibalism of younger members of its own species. But that's something that's actually pretty common, even in the fish we still have, you know, swimming in the Great Lakes today. I think, Titus, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, uh, pike, northern pike being uh, cannibalistic. But really, I feel like a lot of predatory fish species you know, go really abide by the seafood diet, meaning if they see food, they're going to eat it. Yeah, that's absolutely true, Katie. Um, yeah, you know, they they are out there, they are eating. And, you know, really imagine that you're, you know, if you are a, a fish that eats other fish, and in general, from what we know about, you know, the, the life strategy, you know, kind of reproductive strategy for a lot of these fish, they're kind of, you know, usually not investing a lot of resources, like you're, you're putting out a lot of eggs, a lot of reproductive material, and just kind of, you know, leaving it out there. So even if you are, you know, say, you know, you're eating another uh, fish of your own species, uh, you know, and it's a little fish, it's probably not your kids. So if you're eating someone else's kids, you're actually helping, um, yeah, you're, you're helping your uh, reproductive, uh, your offspring. So, uh, our little video here uh, just showing, you know, what, you know, fish eating other fish. And that's a really big muskie eating a slightly smaller uh, northern pike. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Like, I mean, I like that he's just kind of swimming around with it. Like, you know, OK, it, it almost like, feels. This is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is mine. I'm going to try eat this. I don't know what the logistics are on getting that, but you it's know, swallowing that, but. You know, and, and, you know, I have seen pictures of like, you know, a giant lake trout with a slightly, you know, just slightly smaller fish that slightly they've tough. been able to swallow and, you know, the tail sticking, still sticking out of the mouth. So, uh, yeah, fish like to eat other fish. They do. And and I, I'm glad you brought up, Titus, you know, the idea that a lot of times it's fish eating younger, uh, 
you know, younger, not their children. But even in some cases, uh, you know, parents will eat their offspring, which I'm sure, you know, any stressed parent has probably thought about once or twice. But um, the example I really like is a species that lives in the Great Lakes uh, called the fantail darter. So darters are typically these, you know, small little guys that hang out at the bottoms of, of streams. Uh, you know, doesn't seem too too frightening or anything, but the males actually will eat their own eggs. Uh, but what's weird about it is they eat the eggs if there's only a few of them. So like if they have a big egg mass uh, that they're protecting, they typically won't eat as many of those eggs. But if it's only a few eggs, it's basically this kind of trade-off for them. They They don't want to expend that much energy for what they would be, you know, what would be kind of like a not great return on investment. So it's it's interesting that they'll eat all of the eggs because they're like, this is outweighing the benefit or outweighing the energy I would spend protecting them. So yeah, so this came from a study uh, a couple, I mean, it's a couple decades old now, 1997. But, you know, I think what's Katie, cool you're there. you're making me feel old here. I, 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 you know, just and I was few. in college in 97, but... <laughs> could have contributed to something like this exactly you know what's the what's the cutoff on eggs like what what's your uh what's, what's their over uh, under yeah like what what's too few to make it worthwhile that's a really good question i think you know in, from what i read in the study all of the fan male fantail darters will eat some eggs but it really you know really comes down to, is this going to be worth my time? Um, and so, you know, maybe it's a, a clutch of, you know, less than a hundred. Cause you know, sometimes a lot of fish will have lay a lot of eggs as you talked about um, with the assumption that not many of them will survive. Yeah. I mean, I have, I have the same problem with things like uh, you know, we just had a lot of Valentine's day candy and now, exactly. now it's all on, sa all on sale. And it's like, I'm going to eat all of it. And uh, yeah, so same right. strategy here. Same strategy. Exactly. That's hilarious. So, um, so I just, I, I'm certainly not thinking about how I've, I wouldn't eat my children. It, like what I'm like trying to think like, I would never, for me? <laughs> never going to happen. Um, we do have a, a question though, from uh, Stuart Carlton. Um, from Hi, our guest, our usual <laughs> host, occasional <laughs> guest question an answerer when yeah. he's not available. Yeah. So um, don't some male catfish carry young in their mouth? If so, do they ever eat them? And maybe I'll throw that um, to Katie first to, to see if you have some thoughts there. Yeah. So there are a ton of species of fish that where either the males or the females will basically carry the young in their mouth as a sort of protection mechanism to protect them from other predators that might eat them. Um, I'm not entirely sure like how often consumption happens in that case, you know, it's very possible. And there, like I said, there's a whole range of species that do it. Um, so I don't know to what extent it is, you know, maybe it's an accidental swallowing. It's like, uh Oh, you know, yeah, Don't. I mean, you got you got all these kids swimming around your exactly. mouth, and they could, you know, they if they swim the wrong way, they're really persistent about it. Uh, you know, evolutionarily, that's probably not a, a behavior that you really want to support in your mouth brooding uh, young. So, right. yeah, probably you know, take care of that. And one other thing, I mean, this is you know not specific to the ones that carry them in their mouths, but a lot of species that do parental care, especially. Uh, with the fathers providing care, once the, the, basically the children get too big, if they keep hanging around and don't swim off, you know, then the dad might eat some of them, basically like a way of kicking them out of the nest. Like you're old enough now, get off. <laughs> fly free, baby bird, fly free. Fly free. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, wild. Okay. Um, so I don't see, so yeah, let's get going on the, the cannibalism. And just to be clear, the videos we were showing, so that's not all cannibalism, like the pike eating the, and the muskie right. eating each other. Um, but it is kind of wild that like fish that are gigantic will, will go after each other. Um, okay. So um, the <laughs> seasonal question, um, we are switching to, so I saw, um, 
a story. Uh, admittedly, you know, we're all in the Great Lakes region. We're in the, the Midwest. We are not in Florida unless people, well, it's spring breaks are coming up. So maybe people are going there for that. Um, I saw a story. It was um, somebody who was uh, like a on the dock talking and they were down in Florida and they were talking about how the cooler winter was really pumping fish up. And it made me think like, okay, what, what the heck does that even mean? And I think what they were, they were talking about was um, that the temperatures when they had kind of cooler temperatures, when you bumped back up to warmer temperatures, it like got the fish excited somehow. Um, so can, can you guys explain, like, does anything like that happen in the Great Lakes? Are there things where like you kind of have a, a colder winter makes the fish really, really excited later on in life or something like that. Maybe I'll throw that one to Titus first. Um, yeah. You know, I, I can see that, you know, I, I wouldn't, I, you know, I watched the video too, and it's, you know, it's kind of a, from a, like an angling perspective, I think they're excited to eat and, you know, maybe that's what we're seeing here. You know, they, especially in a place like Florida where it's generally warmer um, you've had uh, you know, you've had kind of a, a few weeks of colder, uh, maybe less activity, maybe you're not feeding as much. And so when it warms up, you're like, hey, my metabolism says I need to eat and I haven't been eating a lot. So, you know, going out and, uh, you know, really uh, starting to feed. And I, you know, I, I think we could have a similar thing here in the Great Lakes. And, uh, you know, really right, you know, especially this winter, like we are getting into the uh, fish are pumped up for spring spawning. And, you know, that's, that's on its way too. And, you know, lots of, uh, if you're say, uh, a, a, you know, a, a spring run sucker or a Northern Pike, uh, that's queuing on temperature, like you're going to queue on it, even if it's, you know, say in, in February or early March. And we're actually with our sucker spawning monitoring, we are going to set up basically three weeks earlier than usual, just because this is such a winter, like a mild winter. So, you know, you don't want to miss it because it's going to, when it happens, it happens. Yeah. And that's a really good po point, Titus. You know, we just have had a very strange winter here and, you know, fish are exothermic or cold blooded. So they're, you know, all of their body functions, their metabolism depends on the temperature of the water. So any change in temperature, you know, is going to affect them probably more than us as, you know, warm blooded mammals who can regulate our body, body temperature. And, you know, speaking of the Great Lakes, we've seen really low ice cover, like historically low this year. I think um, the NOAA Great Lakes uh, environmental lab that folks focuses on basically everything happening in the Great Lakes recently, yeah, just this past week came out with some some numbers about how historic, how, how historically low that ice coverage is. And I think Lake Ontario and Lake Erie are basically near or tied with some of their lowest historic ice coverage on, on record, which is just wild to me. Um, so that, yeah, Titus is totally right. That's going to have a big impact on when, when everybody starts spawning, when things start picking up again, for sure. Yeah, it's definitely something we've seen up here in, in Northeastern Wisconsin. Uh, you know, uh, big uh, kind of Green Bay has, has really developed mm -hmm. into really, well, it's developed recently in the last decade, really targeting Lake Whitefish. But, you know, ice fishing is definitely, uh, it's a part of the culture of the Great Lakes states and, and the northern, you know, northern hemisphere. Like people get out on frozen water. It's, you know, I, I like to think of it as the great equalizer. Like you can go to those places that you don't need a boat, you know, to get out there. Like you can walk pretty much anywhere. And uh, this winter, the ice hasn't been great. And, you know, like Green Bay barely barely had ice cover. It didn't really have any good ice at all. And, you know, now we're, we're kind of into, yeah, here's a, you know, a story about, about ice fishing being canceled and, you know, lots of different, uh, different tournaments, different activities. Uh, you know, the Berka binder, the biggest 50, 50th Berkey binder this, this winter is going to be this little five kilometer loop, uh, oh, wow. instead of the, you know, they're still going to have it, but it's, it's not the real regular one. So yeah. Yeah. And that's, guys. that's a good point. Like the, the story that was just up on the screen was about Houghton Lake in Michigan, which originally had scheduled their ice fishing tournament for January. And then we're like, well, like maybe let's push it off till February because oftentimes like our ice maximums in the great lakes happen, you know, kind of 
mid late February, but they were, it was rescheduled for this past weekend. And that article was just saying it got canceled again. And they obviously didn't reschedule it this time around. Um, and we've seen something similar, you know, uh, the sturgeon season in black lake was canceled which is you know typically a very like important cultural event so it's just there we're seeing kind of the effects of this um definitely in in the the angling around the great lakes this winter yeah and i i you know on a sturgeon note too here in north northern wisconsin or northeast wisconsin i mean we have the biggest lake sturgeon population in the lake winnebago system the the kind of two week uh, sturgeon spearing season for us is a, it's a huge like cultural, you know, piece of the culture. It's a huge tourism draw and the ice on Lake Winnebago and Lake Winnebago, it's a large lake, but it's also really shallow. So, you know, it should, it has the potential to produce some ice and it has been, uh, you know, like they, they can't cancel the season because of the, you know, just the regulations, but uh, hardly any, you know, very few people out there. I think opening weekend, it was like a hundred shacks out on the ice compared to two to 3000 shacks in a wow. typical year. So, you know, very different, uh, you know, where I, I get these daily emails about, you know, here's, cause it's one of the reasons we have this great sturgeon spearing is cause they, they manage it so well. And so you get like every day you can get these emails that are like, you know, this number of males were harvested, this number of females, uh, you know, this number of immature females too. So, uh, and, and the numbers are really small. It's, you know, 20, 25, I think 24 fish were harvested yesterday, which is not a lot, not a lot of sturgeon from the, you know, 2,500 to 3,000 that you can harvest in total. Wow. That's crazy. So, um, and just to be clear, the pictures we were showing there were of past years, like yeah. 2012, 2014. Um, and this year, you know, and there's like some language in some of those stories, like in good conscience, we can't send people out when it's not safe and things like that. So, um, yeah. So um, I will note there were a, a couple of comments on the cannibalism front. Um, so we'll back up to there. Yes, um, back to cannibalism. So <laughs> back to cannibalism. <laughs> Happy things all around this Monday morning. Um, okay, so there was uh, uh, Amun Kohli said, Amun Preet Kohli said, uh, sharing an observation from our lab, have seen this in rainbow trout as well. We would bring eggs to hatch in our lab and some from each batch would grow to be big and cannibalistic. Um, I feel yeah, like you know, another example with that, like from aquaculture, like I, I know people are trying to raise uh, things like uh, walleye, in in hatchery environments and that's definitely you know walleye are fish that eat other fish and they really need to be very very active in grading them by size because if you get you know a small walleye in a tank with a larger walleye they're gonna eat their their you know basically brothers and sisters and cousins uh pretty pretty quickly so that, you know one of the one of the challenges here with trying to grow you know, essentially walleye, rainbow trout, you know, these are our predators and we're trying to grow them in these, uh, these controlled environments. Um, you know, sometimes they're like, Hey, I think, you know, that fish feed you're throwing in is great, but I'd really rather be eating, uh, you know, some of these wiggly fish that are swimming around. So definitely uh, cousin Harry. Yeah. 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 The cousin Harry. <laughs> You go like that. Oh, that's really funny. Okay. I mean, sorry. It's so funny, but it is. Um, it makes the family reunion a little bit awkward is all we're saying. Bit, so yeah. A little bit. And so um, Stuart again had said, the dang fish in my aquarium keep reprodu reproducing. We'll need, so we'll, we'll need some to turn to cannibalism soon or it's going to be an issue. However, I did want to ask like, um, based on what you were just saying, Titus, um, you know, that people need to be active in, in sorting things by size. So basically, if you want to grow a fish like that in aquaculture, you kind of have to go out and like, like, ev like every day, every couple of days and be retanking them is like, is, I don't know, that's probably not a verb, but like moving them to other tanks. Is that how it goes? Yeah. Basically, you know, one strategy is you can give them kind of a, a space to hide in that, you know, kind of like, if you imagine like a, you know, like a cage basically where they could swim in, but their larger siblings and cousins can't, you know, that kind of gives them a, a place to escape from predation. But really a lot of it is, kind of, yeah, you are kind of sorting them as they grow. And, you know, really if you're, 
you know, you're growing them for say an aquaculture food market, you know, you, you want to select out, you know, certain genetics there too. Like, you know, fish food is money and, you know, you want to, you know, kind of select the ones that are going to grow faster and, uh, you know, really like any, any agriculture, uh, you know, that's fish farming is, is farming and, um, yeah, so it, it can be very active, you know, and it, it does depend on, you know, that kind of growth rate of different, different individuals, different, you know, genetic kind of combinations. Cool. I just okay. had this horrifying vision as Titus was talking about farming and I'm like, oh my God, these cows eating other cows, but you know. <laughs> Not everything in, in the aquatic realm translates perfectly to. Don't kid yourself, Timmy. Okay. So, all right. So we'll do a reset really quickly here and I won't go down the Simpsons rabbit hole. Um, this is Ask Dr. Fish, a show where our two Dr. Fishes answer your fish questions, science questions, and life questions. If you have a question for our doctors, put it into the chat right now and we will be able to answer it during this episode. Um, if you have a question that you'd like to be answered in a future episode, uh, you could email us at askdr fish at gmail.com. Normally we can do that on the fly, but since we don't have the person who monitors that email there today, um, we can't really do that one. Okay. So we had an email um, from Niall Clancy, a member of the Montana chapter of the American Fisheries Society, or as those in the know call it, which I'm not always in the know with acronyms, AFS. Um, so they have a new book about becoming a, a fishery biologist that they, they were sharing with us. Um, so let's go maybe to, to Titus first. So like, how can one become a doctor fish? Yeah, that's, that is a, a great question. It's also a really, you know, I, I, I've talked, you know, I get to talk to a lot of kind of young professionals and graduate students. Um, uh, you know, one of the great things about going to like a, a Montana chapter of AFS, or I, we just had our Wisconsin chapter meeting of AFS uh, last month. And there's always kind of a, a really good uh, set up for connecting uh, professionals with, you know, like grad students and undergrads. And, you know, I, I think one of the one of the things that I always like to say is that, you know, we have kind of our individual experiences and, you know, I think we all have our own path. Like the way I got to where to here right now, you know, talking to everybody about uh, fish is different th than the way that Katie got here. Um, so, you know, we all have our, our kind of own own paths, but uh, to me, I think one of the really big uh, things to to really follow is, uh, you know, experiences and trying different things and really being able to demonstrate that, hey, you know, I have handled fish and I've, I've spent time in boats and, and, th and those kinds of things can be really helpful. Um, and, you know, generally within, say, if you're an undergrad, uh, you know, there are usually opportunities to do that within school as a volunteer or, you know, in the summer. It's a, you know, what a great summer job is riding along with some biologists. And and I, I love working with uh, undergrad students in the summer, too, you know, giving them lots of these experiences to, you know, set some nets in the Great Lakes and maybe fill some waders uh, in a wetland, which is an essential experience. Uh getting stuck in mud, uh, actually getting our boat stuck in Green Bay and, and uh, ha everybody had to get out of the boat. We had to push it. It didn't work that well. You know, that's that's what happens when I'm in charge. Uh, we get stuck. How about you, Katie? I, I feel like a lot of us have stories about boats failing uh, or us failing. But anyway, Katie, how I, about you? I was going to say, you know, we could have a whole episode of Ask Dr. Fish on Fieldwork Fails and <laughs> tell you about the time, you know, the thunderstorm was coming and our motor died. So that 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 will be another episode. But yes, I 100% agree with everything Titus said in terms of, you know, getting diff diverse experiences, you know, Maybe field work is what you really like to do, but maybe you more like working in a lab or doing something more kind of computer based, like mod mod it, modeling and uh, figuring that out. So I think research, especially like if you're in the undergrad stage, is just so valuable to figure out what you like doing and what you don't like doing in terms of research. I'll also add that, you know, everyone's path to becoming a Dr. Fish is different, but, you know, 
the science part of our job is only one aspect of it. And there are a lot of skills that aren't necessarily always taught in grad school uh, that are really valuable to being a Dr. Fish. Things like, uh, you know, communicating your science, working with non-scientists, uh, kind of leadership skills, like Titus said, you know, leading the research crew out in the field. And so I really think that, you know, yes, obviously you need to be involved in research and building those skills, but you also don't want to forget some of your other kind of more people skills because uh, the, working with the fish is easy. Working with the people is difficult. Yeah, it's definitely true. And yeah, I mean, I, and I, I was just talking to, I did three presentations last week. So talking to all kinds of different people and it's like, Hey, you know, so I would love to, to have it just be the science. Like, love you know, that. this, we're going to show you the science because it's going to convince you, but really that is, that is, you know, one step, but it's also, you know, it's, it's relationships, it's communication. Um, I, I'm going to plug this book, Ooh. uh, which is uh, called Lessons in Leadership. Um, and I just, I'm going to plug it because I got to write a chapter in here, which is, you know, nice. it's basically three pages long, but um, uh, it's, uh, I called my little chapter uh, Leadership for Generalists because I, of course, mm -hmm. am a fishery specialist who has never had any formal education in like fisheries biology, but hey, you pick it up over the decades. And now that I'm uh, 20 plus years into my my scientific career, I, I guess I can claim to be a fish biologist at this point. But, uh, you know, just kind of uh, what I got to write write about, you know, it is it is taking the skills that you've you've brought. Like I grew up on a farm and I was a beekeeper and, uh, you know, not necessarily water related, but, you know, the the types of like running a crew and you know, organizing things and getting the work done is definitely, you know, those types of things are very useful if you're, you know, running a, a field crew. So, um, and, and also fails, lots of fails there that, uh, you know, learning lessons uh, along the way. Yeah. And that's a great point too, Titus, about, you know, highlighting your other experiences, even if they're not necessarily at, you know, fisheries based or even science based, but highlight, you know, if you're, interviewing for a position or trying to get a research spot, you know, saying, I, I have these skills, you know, that I've developed in these other experiences I've had, and I can bring these to the table, I think is something that, you know, sometimes we think about, okay, well, I haven't had any, you know, research experience, but you do still have kind of those other things. Like I have attention to detail. And so that will help me, you know, be, be conscious in the lab and, and, you know, be able to mark all of my uh, tubes correctly and keep track of everything in a spreadsheet. So I think you can definitely capitalize on experiences you've had, but always, you know, keep trying to get in, uh, new experiences. So you figure out kind of what you like doing. Like for me, I, I realized early on in undergrad, I didn't want to be in a lab 24 seven. I wanted to be out on a boat. So that was helpful when it came time to like figure out what I wanted to do for grad school. Wearing your flippy floppies. Wearing my flippy floppies on my boat. <laughs> I mean, so, it's amazing. Like we can actually, you can have a job where you get to be outside all the time. It's great. And, it you know, and you can also get stuck where, you know, if you move up the ladder in, in a fisheries career, you know, I know a lot of kind of senior fish biologists who, you know, they're, they're in the office all the time. So, you know, even that it's like, you know, you can, you can, and maybe, you know, over time that becomes a thing you also want to do. You're like, I don't, you know, I don't want to spend my whole summer uh, out in a boat. I want to, you know, send other people out. So. Okay. Cool. So um, thank you. And I just want to make a plug for um, write, learn how to write, read lots of different things and be, I don't, I, I feel like there's nowhere that writing won't help you. So um, even though I'm not a doctor fish. So um Okay, thanks so much. And um, apologies if anyone's joining us on Facebook. Sorry that the first feed didn't work. We had like some kind of uh, mess up and the easiest thing for me to do was just start another feed. So if you were planning to come, we'll try to post the link for this afterward. We apologize. Um, we're, we're doing better every time, but we still make mistakes. Okay, um, we have a typical spot during our episodes 
that is who's spawning now because there's always someone who's spawning <laughs> so we're gonna throw it over to uh dr titus and um and ask titus who's spawning now in the great lakes <laughs> yeah so not a lot of spawning going on uh we do have uh fall spawning so we do have eggs that incubate over the winter but this is the time of year february uh mid-february Berbatine day. It is, of course, when the burbot spawn, one of the few fish that is uh, spawning under the ice, as it were. Uh, maybe not this year because there isn't as much ice uh, on the lake, but they are, you know, they are one of the few fish that will spawn right in the middle of winter. Um, you know, and, and I, I love burbot. They're one of my favorites. Uh, you know, look at our logo. That's a burbot in there with me. That was my one fish for this show that I got to pick. And, uh, you know, burbot are really cool. They they actually make noises. They've discovered that through the science. Um, they so I, also... Uh, I think oh, I can play no. the noises. Here, let me give oh, it a try. Let's try it. All right. Yeah, it's a burbot beat. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Some excited burbot there. So, uh, you know, probably males. I think the, the idea is they're actually uh, kind of like drumming on their swim bladders with uh, the muscles um, that run along those. So uh, burbot, really cool fish species, freshwater uh, member of the cod family, the only freshwater species for the cod family and also delicious. Um, uh, eat those if you get a chance. So Keep, keep an eye out for it. They, they're tasty. They also have some great names, other common names like lawyer, eel pout. I think, and then is it poor man's lobster? Yes, or, yes. Okay. I Well, I like to think of lobster as poor man's burbot. That is my, uh, you know, lobster. Yeah, anybody can get a lobster, but yeah. can you get a burbot? No. Yeah, and it, we don't care about those invertebrates, you know. No, no. <laughs> Y'all are killing me. Okay. <laughs> so, and of so, course, we will be talking about food later. And if you, you know, it's so simple. You take some burbot, you, uh, it has this loin along the back, kind of along the spine. You get these really just kind of nice uh, medallion of meat. Mm -hmm. And you can, I've deep fried those, but I've also, you can just boil them and then dip them in butter and they're delicious. You know, that, that's kind of the poor man's uh, uh, lobster kind of way to prepare it because it, you know, you dip anything in butter, it's delicious. Everything's better with butter. Absolutely. <laughs> so I'm actually going to gonna flip to that right now. I'm going to double check that there are no comments or questions. Okay. I'm going to flip to our fish challenge because we're talking about eating. We're talking about enjoying things. So um, if you've followed our show um, maybe two episodes ago, Stuart introduced this segment like the Ask Dr. Fish Challenge. So I think in December we were supposed to celebrate Fishmas. And then um, during December, we had a conversation about the Feast of the Seven Fishes and things like that. And so the challenge that I issued was a try a new to you fish dish. And so um, right now I, I'm gonna give my update about what I did. Um, and then if anyone in our audience actually participated in the challenge, please be, uh, share your experiences in the chat. Um, I guess I will say for, for me, it was actually on Christmas Eve, we had some leftover halibut um, that someone had given us, like brought us back from Alaska that I found in the freezer. And so we made um, orange halibut. It was like really, it was really nice. We learned a new like way of cooking the fish. It was kind of like poaching it a little bit. My kids loved it. Um, they're like eight and 10. And so they're actually trying different foods now. It's very exciting. Um, so it was really, really nice. And it was nice to have like a, you know, kind of special Christmassy dish um, with the oranges and the herbs and things like that. And it was really tasty. Um, so, so Titus, what, what did you try? Or did you try, did you have a chance to try anything? And if so, what did you try? I did. So I actually, uh, this was, uh, my mom was visiting and she doesn't get a lot of seafood. So, um, and we've got a lot in our freezer. So I was like, I'm going to try this. So I pulled down the, the recipe books uh, and this is from the uh, the America's Test Kitchen. It's called Sicilian Fish Stew. Um, their recipe used uh, swordfish, which I didn't have, but 
Um, I did have, I had uh, two different kinds of Atlantic or uh, Alaskan salmon here. So that's Kida and Sockeye. I also threw in some Pacific cod. And then up on top are some Georgia wild caught uh, shrimp. So uh, just a, a nice kind of tomato based. Uh, we keep seeing Katie's um, Katie's uh, recipe too. But, uh, you know, uh, fairly simple. I think, uh, you know, I, I in my house, like people aren't necessarily into fish most of the time or some of the time. Um, and, but if you can get enough flavors in there, you know, there's a lot going on and it's, you know, kind of a tomato based thing is, is really good. And then I had leftovers and I actually boiled up some pasta and it, you know, it turned really well into a pasta sauce later on. So, uh, you know, I, I like the, just the, it's, it's a pretty dynamic dish and, uh, you know, it was tasty. So give it a try. That's really awesome. Um, just this past week, I'll go back to invertebrates. Um, we made shrimp Creole because it was Mardi Gras and we did the same thing with the leftover sauce. We were putting it over rice and it was, it was pretty awesome. Um, and yeah, sorry for the flipping back and forth. That's Carolyn's, uh, inability to stop herself from accidentally clicking the wrong thing. Okay. Um, so that Katie, um, did you try something? And if so, what did you try? I did. And so I will say mine was kind of a cop out. You know, I really had had a busy January. Um, and one would think, you know, maybe hors d'oeuvres, that's more of like a holiday thing. I was just like, well, I'm really busy, but I want to try something new. Uh, and so I'd come across this recipe for smoked salmon pinwheels, which are a typical like, you know, party snack where it's basically pieces of uh, smoked salmon with a, a sort of cream cheese filling and you wrap it up in a little pinwheel shape. So I tried this one recipe um, that was really, really straightforward. So I bought some smoked salmon from the store. I bought kind of um, like a cream cheese that I mixed in some herbs with rolled them up and then just had these little pinwheels as nice little protein based snacks that I could pop in my mouth every now and then. It probably is more, like I said, appropriate for a holiday party, but it could just be, you know, me in my apartment, you know, noshing on some smoked salmon and cream cheese, which was good. So Katie, there is nothing wrong with that. I was looking at that. It's like smoked salmon and cream cheese. Uh, you know, I mean, you can't go wrong. It's a wonderful combination. You know, who even needs a bagel? Like just yeah. uh, you're you're using, uh, you know, instead of the, the bagel, you're just rolling it up in, uh, in just the having a little. Yeah, just a little little salmon stack. So yeah, and I'll I'll throw in uh, just some upcoming Eat Wisconsin fish related stuff that uh, Sharon Moan and I are going to be doing. My colleague, who is our our Eat Wisconsin or our fish Wisconsin food fish coordinator at Wisconsin Sea Grant. So we are in a couple weeks. We are going to be heading down to the Milwaukee Sports Show uh, in uh, in Milwaukee, and it's the it's a, a big kind of regional at, at our state fairgrounds, and we're we're gonna do a couple different demos of uh, cooking. Basically, something I've I have been dreaming about for uh, several years is creating the new uh, uh, summer food of the of the Great Lakes, and it should be a lake whitefish roll. So you know you've had uh, lobster rolls out out east. Um, actually, you can get them everywhere now. Uh, but we're going to prepare uh, a cold. Sharon's going to make a cold lobster or uh, whitefish roll. Um, I'm going to make a hot whitefish roll, uh, kind of with a butter all over it. So that's going to be delicious. And then uh, later on in March, we're uh, going to be heading up to the Wisconsin Aquaculture Association meeting, which is going to be hosted in uh, Red Cliff, Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota Aquaculture Association is going to be there too. And we're going to do a little uh, kind of Wisconsin fish demo uh, on the Friday night. So that'll be uh, fun, you know, preparing some, some. So we've got a month of Great Lakes fish. We've got a month of uh, farm raised Wisconsin fish as well. So uh, you can tell I, I mostly just think about uh, what, what food can I eat um, and how can I do that at work? That's so, I mean, you saying like white fish roll kind of thing. I was like, oh yeah, that's how oh, it's yeah. <laughs> so it's great. Um, so another thing that's coming up in, in the next little bit, um, you know, and you talking about Wisconsin makes me think about this too. So first off, I'll, I'll share that Stuart's um, new to him was he was going to try some smelt, which is so Wisconsin. It's kind of like, 
I don't, I don't know. Some I, it's almost I, a cliche. Yeah. 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 Um, so we'll try to maybe we'll try to add um, a link to his video in the show notes for this for when we release the recording of this down the line. Um, but it is fish fry season. Um, this is an awesome T-shirt that, that Titus shared. It says Friday night fish fry in Wisconsin, choice of potato, coleslaw and rye bread. Um, over in Michigan, there are lots of really awesome fish fries too. So um, I believe that our, our next Dr. Fish challenge, am I right that it's um, try a fish fry? Yes. So our next Dr. Fish challenge is going to be uh, kind of a little open ended. Uh, we are going to say try a fish fry, but, you know, maybe we'll have some uh, some subcategories like, you know, uh, best fish fry, how many fish fries you've been to, you know, between now and the next Ask Dr. Fish episode. So it's a little open-ended, but basically getting out there and trying trying some fish fries in your area. Yeah, yeah try that local local fish and and uh, you know see what see what the options are. And you know it doesn't have to be a Friday. Hey, you get a fish fry on Tuesday. Yeah. Why don't you have fish fish tacos? I mean, oh, hey, those are delicious. Tacos. They are yeah. delicious. It's and true. doesn't doesn't have to be fried fish. You know, maybe mm -hmm. it's a baked fish. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so that's our, our Ask Dr. Fish challenge for next time. Um, and again, you know, we encourage you to share with us if you, if you um, participate in this. We like sharing stories and, and people's comments. Um, or share, just share your favorite fish fry, and you know, in your area. Yeah. Go and get your fish. Yeah, yeah. there you go. There you go. Cool. Yeah, we love the insider, uh, <laughs> insider knowledge. We need, yeah, we need the scoop on where to go. Um, Okay. So um, once again, this is Ask Dr. Fish, a show where our two Dr. Fishes answer your fish questions, science questions, and life questions. Um, if you have a question that we'll, we'll try to answer before the end of today, please go ahead and put it into the chat. Or if you have comments, we like to share those too. Um, if you would like to have a question answered in the future, please go ahead and email it to askdrfish at gmail.com. So um, one final question, something that comes up a lot um, in the Great Lakes in particular, but it happens all over the world, is, is fish stocking. And so for those who, who maybe haven't grown up thinking about this or haven't been in a position, things like that. So um, Katie, maybe I'll throw it to you first. What What is fish stocking and why do it? Yeah, so fish stocking is really just, you know, the idea that you raise fish kind of artificially, you know, whether that's in a place like a hatchery or a pond, and then you take those fish that you've raised and put them into a water body, whether, you know, that's to increase the fishing opportunities for anglers or to reintroduce a species maybe that has been, um, you know, the numbers have been uh, down because of any number of factors, something that's threatened or endangered. Uh, and the idea behind that is, you know, kind of supplementing fish uh, in an area. It can be, you know, either native fish uh, that are raised and stocked in systems, but sometimes it's non-native fish, um, which one example in the Great Lakes are some of the Pacific salmon like Chinook and Coho. Um, and in some cases, you know, some of these fish do have some natural reproduction, but to maintain the levels that, you know, kind of anglers expect it's supplemented with stocking from various, you know, state agencies like Department of Natural Resources. Yeah, it's like I, you know, I mentioned I was talking earlier about, you know, in our cannibalism section, you know, thinking about within a an aquaculture system, because basically fish hatcheries and stocking fish, it's aquaculture. It is. Um, you know, just the the same as as any other kind of fish farm. It's just, you know, growing these fish to release. And and what the what you know the farming environment gives these fish is just the ideal conditions um you know generally uh lots of mortality for fish is is in this kind of first you know from the eggs there's a lot of mortality where the eggs don't hatch or uh they get infected with fungus or they're eaten by crayfish or brown gobies or uh you know apparently other their parents uh their parent uh pantel darters potentially so um you know we have this uh you know, the controlled environment really uh, can, you know, 
aid success. And so there's lots of different considerations when you talk fish stocking, like you can, um, and it, it's also a, a balance thing. So uh, the longer a fish would stay in a hatchery, the more it's going to cost to maintain. But uh, generally the larger size when it's released, the the higher the survival. So, um, you know, you get a lot of, you know, it, it's all very species specific. So uh, say for a species like walleye, um, you can, you know, get those and, and you can release them as fry. So they're very small, like a, an inch long. So you've, you've kind of gotten them past the, the egg and the larval stage. You release them as fry and you can release a lot of them that way because that's fairly easy and it's a short time in the hatchery. Or you can uh, raise them to fingerling size. So they're kind of the size of your finger um, or even uh, longer than that. So, you know, generally it's all these trade-offs in, you know, deciding which species, how much space you have, um, you know, how much it's going to cost. Uh, and then, you know, what, like, what cost is it going to be? Like how many of those walleye that get stocked are actually going to be caught by someone down the road too. So um, you can actually kind of, uh, you know, and we have lots of great science now where you can, uh, you know, tag these fish and actually see, uh, you know, for Katie's example, a Pacific salmon, like we can look at, uh, these little, uh, very tiny, uh, coated wire tags. So these tags that have uh, a little number on them implanted in these, you know, very small salmon before they're released. And, uh, then you can go to a fish cleaning station, collect that head and pull that number out from that little tag and actually see, oh, you know, three years ago, this individual fish was released from, you know, this port. And then, uh, you know, you, you look at that at, all around the lakes and can actually make decisions about, Hey, what's the best place to stock a fish? What's the, you know, maybe we shouldn't stock the fish here because they're not surviving. And uh, you know, that's just kind of good, good management. Yeah. And I'm really glad Titus brought up balance too, because that's a big thing in the great lakes. Um, not only in terms of balance of when to release the, the raised fish, but also like how many fish to release based because you want to, make sure you're not releasing too many predators and not having enough prey to feed them, which is something that I know, you know, there's been a lot of work and a lot of research done to, to understand, you know, we've had the lakes change a lot because of things like invasive species. And so that's changed how many prey fish are available. And so a lot of times it's balancing how many of these predators are we going to have so that we can keep a predator prey balance that doesn't throw the whole system out of whack. And you shared this really cool resource that I shared the link in there. Can you tell us what we're looking at, Katie? Yeah. So this is um, a really cool interactive database that you can look and see where, like, basically what species were released in what different parts of the Great Lakes. Um, and you can look by year, you can look by agency species, um, and you can kind of see like, okay, you know, last year there were this many lake trout released in Lake Michigan or, you know, wherever your, your uh, location of interest is. So I find it just a really cool way to look at what's going on around the Great Lakes. Um, I particularly was very interested looking at like where lake sturgeon were released because I just think lake sturgeon are the coolest and I like seeing them, you know, I like seeing efforts towards restoring them, but you can look at whatever your species of interest is. Yeah. And I'd say this really captures, you know, and, and this, this is a great resource to have, like, you know, looking at, you know, the science and the management of yeah. the Great Lakes like this is, it really shows the collaborative nature of how these decisions are made. Um, like, you know, we have two countries involved, we have multiple states, we have multiple uh, tribal nations as well. And everyone is, you know, kind of working together, I think, to really, you know, do those balanced decisions, because, you know, the, the fish we stock in Wisconsin are going to swim, you know, they're going to go everywhere. They're going to, you know, swim across state lines. They don't really care. Uh, they don't know those uh, maps are there. So, uh, you know, you really do need the the kind of cooperative consensus based uh, decision making and, uh, you know, keeping it balanced and keeping it, you know, we want sustainable, sustainable fisheries. So it is a, a great kind of, you know, lots of work going on. I was just yes. as 
So, so I, I geek out over stuff like this all the time. So uh, another way, so Titus, you mentioned the tags that are kind of stable, but um, there's also uh, uh, GLATOS, the Great Lakes Acoustic Telemetry Observing System, I think, um, or something like that. I'm very bad with acronyms, as we mentioned before, but they have stations all over. So this is a map of some of them. And it's a super cool way, because like you said, the, the fish don't, um, the fish don't. Respect, respect boundaries, yeah. the like legal boundaries that humans have in, imposed. So, um, so it's a really really cool resource to to track things. So. Yeah, the we've only got a we've got a bunch of suckers that have acoustic tags swimming around Green Bay oh. uh, right now. So uh, that is something that you know. Hopefully, we'll we'll get to talk to Karen Murchie someday at the Shed Aquarium and uh, get an update on uh, you know what are those fish doing and where are they going and. You know, GLaDOS is such it's such a great resource right now because there's so much. And it's again, it's about cooperation. Like I can buy a few tags and maybe get a receiver, but it's all this working together. And there's so many receivers out there now. Like you saw those green dots. If you're looking at the map, you're listening to this. Imagine the Great Lakes covered in all these green dots like uh, green chicken pox. And uh, but those are all, uh, you know, basically receivers listening for the pings coming out of these tagged fish and. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of species tagged and they're swimming around and, and everybody's collecting data and sharing it. So it's really, it's exciting times in the Great Lakes. Genuinely, it really, really is. So, okay. So um, once again, thank you to everyone who's joining us online and apologies if you're dealing with um, with any uh, issues. Some of them are on our end, I know, but there have been some things happening that are kind of bouncing around. Um, Toward the end of each show, we do a game um, where we basically rely on the fact that uh, Katie and Titus are really knowledgeable and super professional and can kind of throw each other back and forth. Um, we have not played 20 questions in a while, so I think that that's what we're going to do today. Um, so Katie is going to... actually, uh, Katie, you pick, would you like to be the asker or the Ooh. person who picks the fish? I'll pick the fish this time. All right. So Katie's going to pick a fish and then Titus has 20 questions. And I'm not going to do what Stuart normally does where he has us go around because I oh. am just a liability for you, Titus. So I will just count how many um, how many questions we have left. So Katie, let us know when you're ready to go. And those in, in the online, feel free to put your guesses in and I'll, I'll try to share those questions. Katie can see your suggestions as well and Titus can see your suggestions. Okay. Katie, okay. good to go. I'm good All to right. go. Titus. Okay. Uh, okay. Question one. Uh, adults are large or small? Large. Okay. Large adults. Um, let's see. Uh, number of dors dor two dorsal fin or two. Yeah. Two dorsal fins or one. Let me double check. <laughs> <laughs> one. One dorsal fin. Okay. Uh, any dorsal spines? I don't believe so. No. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, adipose fin presence, present or absent? Uh, let me see. No. Okay. No adipose fin. Um, uh, let's see. Mouth type. Let's say, is it a terminal mouth right off the end of the face? I would say it's terminal, maybe a little subterminal. Okay. Terminal, subterminal. Uh, does it eat fish? No. Not a fish eater. Okay. Uh, does it, hmm, see, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of pressure to ask I know, all it the just questions. All the questions. I know. And I have to like keep track of them too, which is, uh, okay. I'm just, yeah, I enjoy the, the numbers too, that I get to watch. Uh, I know you get to watch it. Yeah. No pressure. No yeah. Pressure. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, does it have, uh, is the. Is the dorsal fin or, okay, caudal fin. So is the yeah. tail square? No, it is not square. Is the tail forked? 
Yeah, not like a sharp, deep fork, though. Okay, but generally forked. Yeah. Um, is does it uh, is it a nest garter? Does it guard nests? No. Okay. Does it live in the benthos? I would say you generally will see it closer to the benthos. That was a question from the audience. So we're right. at 10 now. Excellent. Uh, is it in the sucker family? No. Okay. Not a sucker. Does it, uh, this is terrible. You guys are I killing don't. me with this. <clears throat> Stop I need me. Stuart. I need Stuart's bad questions to really help me reset. Um, Where's Stuart when you need him? I know. What uh, one uh, hint? Ask about its native status. Oh, is it uh, native to the Great Lakes? Nope. Okay. That was very kind of you, Kate. Yes, <laughs> it's a good question. Definitely something to be aware of. Um, is it? Let's see. Does it eat plants? Yes. Is it a grass carp? It is a grass carp. Boom. Yay! Woo! <laughs> we didn't do the we didn't do the drum roll that Stuart oh. always does, but well, that's all right. We can do it. All <laughs> okay, so we can add that in through the the miracle of, uh, <laughs> of editing. He probably will, but we're not going to give him space for it. Ha, right. ha, ha. But he'll figure out a way to do it just to just to spite me. Okay, so Titus, your sixty second soapbox because the winner of the game gets sixty seconds to talk about whatever they want to talk about. Titus, go. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, so 60 seconds to talk about something. And, you know, I am going to just reinforce our, our contest for this this coming two months. And it is go try some new fish fries. Um, and I want you to go out. I want you to try new fish. I want you to try fish fries different ways. I know that, you know, I actually I used to own that uh, Wisconsin fish fry shirt until I, it totally wore out because I wore it so much because, you know, it's sort of in line with what my job is. Uh, so it doesn't have to be just uh, deep fried fish. There's lots of ways you can eat fish. Why don't you uh, whip up some, uh, some fish on your own on Friday too? So, uh, you know, try some new things, go to some new places, uh, enjoy fish, uh, meet your neighbors. Uh, yeah, have fun with it. So, uh, you know, definitely a time of year that that a lot of people are eating fish. And hey, why it doesn't need to be just this time of year. You can eat fish all the time. So do it. Fish Lovely. Friday every Friday. Make fish every Friday. Friday fish Friday. I mean, I, I'm from Wisconsin. So that's basically uh, <laughs> okay. that's sort of our culture here anyway. So, OK. Awesome. And in lieu of, of Stuart being here, thank you all for joining us. Um, and this will be slightly less professional than it normally is, but you know, we'll just do our best. All right. Ask Dr. Fish is brought to you by the fine people at Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, Wisconsin Sea Grant, and Booby Dog Media. The show is produced and hosted by Stuart Carlton, Carolyn Foley, Dr. Fish Katie O'Reilly, and Dr. Fish Titus Elfair. The live broadcast is supported by Motia Gumbiande, and the podcast version of the show is edited by It's Still Me. It's Still Me somehow. It's Still Me. The podcast artwork is by Ethan Kosak, and you can view his portfolio at ethankosak.com. That is K-O-C-A-K. If you have questions for the Dr. Fish, send an email to askdrfish at gmail.com. Use the Twitter hashtag. Yeah, we're still calling it Twitter. Ask Dr. Fish or call our hotline at 765-496-4474. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you on see you live on Facebook and YouTube at 11 a.m. Eastern on usually the second Monday of every even month. In between now and then, if you have fish questions, science questions, or life questions, just ask Dr. Fish. How long are you going to make me do this?
There we go. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. And um, please watch out for a future episode and send us some questions if you have them. Thank you. Bye. Bye.